Chair Mehran, you can go ahead and start. We are live. Thank you. Okay, I'm using my official brick from the Gateway uh, Memorial Arch Gateway Project, and I am calling to order the meeting of the Governance and Policy Committee. This is the December 20 meeting. We have a very full agenda, so I'm going to begin. I'm not going to review for everyone uh, what to do in terms of raising your hand if you need to speak and, and all of that, because we went up through all of that yesterday. I want to get immediately to the agenda. The first item on the agenda is a resolution related to the amendments to the urgent approval authority policy. This is a matter of for action today. We reviewed the resolution at a, our October meeting. A revised version was sent to you. Uh, and as you know, uh, this morning, a further revised version was sent to you that uh, corrected a couple of grammatical things that I happened to pick up uh, last night based on the one that had been sent to us last evening. So at this time, I would invite Regent Rosha to provide us with a summary and any comments he would like to make before we move for discussion. Regent Rosha. Uh, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, so you know, we 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 covered a bit of this um, last month, and I won't uh, belabor it a lot. The 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 major change between last month and this month was responding to some people's concern about what the standard would be for uh, the president making the request, and there was the, the the intent was not to change the the circumstance. In fact, you know, as far as I'm concerned, um, you know, we rely greatly on the chair. Uh, uh, you know, to make, you know, assessments. And I, I think the administration can always ask for um, action by the board in, if in the president's uh, estimation, it makes uh, sense for the university. In this instance, it, this, this uses the same language, just reverts back to the same language um, that was already, that, that, well, that is currently in place. So that doesn't change the circumstances uh, for, for making a request for an urgent approval. What this really does, as we as we discussed a bit, is it, it recognizes the technology advantages that we have now. Obviously, we're operating quite differently in in just this last year uh, with our ability to conduct remote meetings. In that, with that technology, our our capacity as a board, um, you know, we can meet uh, frankly within minutes, um, certainly within within a few hours, if if we're able to um, you know, contact uh, a, a quorum or better of the board. Um, in order to do that. And so, in, you know, just with fidelity to our role as individual regents um, and the constitutional charge for the a board of 12 to make determinations for the board, if those circumstances are such that we can convene a group of, you know, convene the board for making decisions based on our, our delegations and reservations, that's what we ought to do. And so this walks through that, that process, whereby um, when the request is made to the, to the chair, if the chair determines that an urgent approval outside of our normal um, regular meeting and special meeting processes uh, would be necessary. Uh, the chair then uh, would seek to would, would determine whether there was enough time to um, to contact uh, the, the full board to try to convene an emergency meeting. Um, in, in any case, whether it's being made by the, the chair and uh, vice chair and, and a committee chair, or if it's made by an emergency meeting, the public doesn't receive notice either way. So there's no difference there. But the ability to then contact the, the, the board uh, put together a, a remote meeting, much as we are meeting today within a matter of moments, um, that that effort would be made. If the effort is made and under circumstances um, that obviously this year could uh, indicates there may be a, an op, uh, a, a situation where the chair reaches out or the board office reaches out and is unable to put together a quorum, this then would charge the president or would authorize the president and the vice chair, and not the president, but the chair, the vice chair, and, uh, uh, and the appropriate committee chair to then go ahead and act. But that this walks you through the process of, of uh, first seeking to get the board together if the board can't be pulled together timely um, to address the significant impact or considerable risk, then the, the uh, chair, vice chair and committee chair are authorized to act. It then, this also then clarifies that upon those decisions, the board is immediately, the rest of the board is provided notification immediately and then we as a board will, would come back and, and uh, validate the decision uh, by ratification um, at our next normal opportunity. So that, that's it in a nutshell. That's pretty straightforward and I would certainly answer any questions or seek to address any concerns. 
All right, thank you very much, uh, Regent Rosha. And just so you know, uh, in the version that was sent out to you this morning, uh, it was highlighted the language that I suggested be added just for uh, grammatical consistency. So that shows up in your highlighted version. Uh, otherwise, the, the resolution in front of you is identical to the one that was uh, contained in the board materials. So if anyone has a question on the screen here, we're unable to show the highlighting uh, that shows up on the attachment that you received this morning in your emails. All right, at this time, we will consider the updated version of the resolution that Regent Rosha has just outlined in place of the version that appears in the docket. Before we begin our discussion, is there a motion to recommend approval of the revised resolution related to amendments to the urgent approval authority policy. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Was there, okay, we have a motion and a second. Thank you very much. Um, before we begin the discussion and uh, I'll look to Sarah to tell me who is interested. Uh, I just have a question for clarification. Um, and I'm wondering if you could put the resolution back on the screen, please. Thank you, Jason. So in the first paragraph, it, it uh, talks about um, if the president is gonna make a request, it says in the middle of that first paragraph, the president shall submit to the board chair a statement describing the matter, et cetera. My question for you, Regent Rosha, is uh, we don't specify here, but um, does it contemplate that the president could submit that uh, statement of request either in writing or orally. In other words, I could envision where there may be situations where um, hopefully it never comes to pass, but there isn't even time to sit down and write something out or do an email and it needs to be a phone call and immediate communication to the board chair. Um, Madam Chair, yes, this is not limiting to written, uh, to a written statement. It's it's you know, maybe a bit clunky as a, as a sentence in that regard, but um, but yeah, it's it's the the president just would would state to the chair, this is the reason why I'm making this request. It does it does not provide that it must be in, in writing or, or um, any other form that way. Okay, thank you for that clarification. At this time, uh, any questions, discussion by any of my fellow regents, uh, Ms. Sarah, can you tell me is anyone on board to want to speak? Uh, sure, Chair Mayron, Regents Davenport and Swigum would like to speak. All right, Regent Davenport. Uh, thank you, Chair Mayron, and good morning. Um, I looked at this pretty carefully and um, a lot of thinking on it. And while the intent um, is good on having an urgent approval process, I really have concerns when we get down to the um, language itself. I think that the current language is appropriate to the intent of an urgent <clears throat> approval process. But when we talk about health and safety and what I, I think back to say Virginia Tech, uh, the 9-11 as it happened on our related to our college campuses. I think about um, a library on fire slowly creeping in on um, valued collections, for example. And I think about uh, the training I think many of us had in NIMS on um, incident management and response. And time is precious. And it just seems to me, although our board is stellar, our board office is stellar, uh, 30 minutes to put a meeting together, um, that'd be pretty quick. Um, I, don't, I don't see it being moments for the, and for the time for the president to have to think about uh, the policy and the statement and the context, you're losing precious time. So that's my concern um, in any delay, um, sitting in the seat of a president, every minute is critical when there's an incident. And so uh, I'm uncomfortable with adding this um, language for delay. Thank you. 
So just so I can clarify, um, and thank you, uh, Regent Davenport. So right now it, it would be you're expressing your concern. So your preference would be to stay with the policy as written. Is that correct? And as, as opposed to this process that Regent Rocha has included here in the proposed revision. Is that correct? Thank you, Chair Marin. That's correct. All right, thank you. I just want to clarify. All right, thank Ma you. Madam Chair, <clears throat> uh, may I offer a point of clarification real quick in response? Certainly. Um, Certainly. Thank you. Regent Davenport, we're in, you and I are in complete agreement, which is why B specifically provides that if the board chair determines, such as a library on fire, that the circumstances giving rise to the president's request for urgent approval do not permit any attempt to contact all regions, then they may act just as they do now. So that the, the, the scenario you describe is, is, is contemplated by this and provides that authority. So it, your, your, your concern is perfectly addressed. Chair Marin? Yes. Yep. Um, and that would be why um, I think our current policy is sufficient. Thank you. All right, thank you. Chair Marin, uh, on this yeah, question. Regent Speak, why don't you, I'll call on you uh, next, uh, after Regent Speak, um, he's next in line here. Thank you, Regent Shu. Uh, Madam Thank Chair. You. Okay, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, thank you for the time. And uh, uh, let me first acknowledge to Regent Rocha that this uh, amended language is a great improvement over the language that we received before regarding the urgent approval. I think it's a great improvement because the, uh, the standard of imminent danger was just extremely, extremely high standard. I don't know how and when it would ever be met. Uh, so I did a little background research as we looked at this urgent approval process to uh, how President Kaler and now President Gable has used it in the very, very few times they've used it. Uh, and it's been very, very few times. And, and as I looked at them, I don't know that any of the times used by President Kaler or President Gable have, have even raised eyebrows, much less a discussion uh, uh, over the past years. Uh, you know, one of them, one of the times related to hiring outside counsel for uh, uh, some to investigate some sexual harassment at the university, uh, a declaration of uh, uh, President Gable used it to declare a public health emergency as a response to COVID-19 last spring. Uh, none of the instances where they've used the urgent approval their presidents have have really even raised concern or, or discussion, including the last one which I assume um, the initiative of, of uh, Regent Rocha has come from. Uh, last June or July, President Gable uh, you used the urgent approval to, uh, to purchase those, uh, those COVID test kits that were paid for by the, uh, by the state, uh, some $10 million. And, and she, the president, even in the previous meeting, told us as a board that she was going to use the urgent approval process because it wasn't quite ready for prime time at that time. She told us she was gonna use it and not a peep from anybody, not even a peep. Uh, so I, I don't think it's been misused the process. I don't think it's been abused by, by any of our presidents. Um, so I tried to relate it to venues that I've been in my life, uh, uh, Madam uh, Chair, uh, um, at the state capitol uh, where I was spent a few years we used to call it a, uh, a solution in search of a problem. You know, many of us wonder why there has to be 3,000 plus bills introduced each year. Well, many of them are solutions in search of a problem, which I, which I think this change in urgent approval is. Um, or uh, I relate to my venue here on the farm that I've been for a few years. And, you know, I kind of break things down here once in a while, but I, I used to run a, a John Deere swatter, swatting oats and hay and and uh, and uh, wheat, um, and I would be my job to run it during the summer. And it would be one rainy period when my dad was still alive. Now this is many years ago. Uh, I was going to work on it. I was going to fix on this swatter while it was raining. So the chain seemed to be a little sloppy to the crimper. I was going to take a half link out, and I did that. And 
that the tarp didn't seem to be running quite All straight. All right, Regent Smigum, I'm going to move you along from this story. So, <laughs> the story's important. The story's okay. important, Madam Chair. I beg, I beg your uh, patience. All right. Story's All right. All right. Well, it turned out I fixed this thing, which I thought was fixed, and all of a sudden it wrecked the timing of the crimper, and uh, the tarp broke. Uh, it ripped. Uh, my dad, using only the language he could, Madam Chair, which I cannot repeat in public, told me, you don't fix what is not broke. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. So the two venues are that. Uh, solution and search, search of a problem. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I think that the uh, the history would show both of those are true. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your. Oops, you've you've um, Regent Spigum has frozen up on my screen. Now he's not. So, all right. I think he was saying thank you. And if you were, I say you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, next, I'm showing is. Regent uh, Shu, and then Sarah, do you want to tell me, are there others who have uh, raised their hand? Yes, Madam Chair, I believe Regent Shu was going to address an earlier comment, but he had already put himself in the queue to perhaps make okay. additional comments. So I'll let you know who has their hand raised at this time. Uh, okay. we, have, we have Regents Kenyanya, Anderson, Regent Shu, and Regent Rocha had raised his hand, but perhaps that was to duck in with his response to Regent Davenport. Okay, we'll... we'll address it. All right, Regent Shu. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I was, uh, I had raised my hand to address um, <clears throat> a point of clarification. I, I really don't see the uh, board as being involved in fighting fires, and I don't know how uh, a fire example would be uh, relevant to this policy, as, um, you know, I don't think Regents would be called to carry out valuable collections from the library or anything like that. So I'm, I was just trying to understand what actually were those examples and how would they affect uh, a decision made by the regents or um, a, a policy uh, or something changed by the president that needed to be addressed uh, urgently in that case. Thank you, Regent Chu. Um, perhaps uh, Mr. Steves, you might be able to address under what circumstances uh, board approval would have to be sought uh, apart from uh, in, uh, an expenditure of a million dollars or more. Uh, I believe there are policies that talk about uh, reputation and other issues related to the university where board approval is required that perhaps the examples by Regent Davenport may fit. Um, Either Madam Mr. Chair. Steves or uh, or Mr. Langworthy, whoever you think should address it. Uh, I'll, Madam Chair, I'll take a shot at it. Uh, with regard to board approval, uh, absolutely nothing changes uh, with um, with what is required, what what the board would be required to approve with this language or the previous or existing language. The underlying thresholds that require board approval remain in place regardless of the process. So what this language is about is about an urgent approval process. It's just about the process by which approval is obtained. And so all of the existing things that would come to the board right now all the things that you see and vote on would would be um, you know would be this would would be intact. They'd be the same kinds of things. So it would be contracts above a million dollars, or if there were an item that, as you point out, Madam Chair, um, uh, had some kind of uh, an unusual public policy consideration to it, um, or uh, you know, or it was a real estate transaction of some sort, or, you know, I mean, there, there's a whole list of things that, uh, that currently come to the board for approval. Those all would be the kinds of things that, uh, that, you know, I guess th there would be maybe some scenario you could dream up that would, uh, necessitate some kind of an urgent approval and could then be, you know, could then fall under this process. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Steves. Uh, the next person who had comments was Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair um, and colleagues for, for this discussion. I, um, I, you know, I've looked at this one for a while and um, 
I, I mean, my main concerns were, you know, the same as my colleagues in terms of, I, I do agree and believe that in electing a president, a board chair and committee chairs, there is some delegation of authority there. Um, and yeah, I had a chance to speak with another colleague a couple of days ago who, who is not in support of this. And I, I tried not to be as well because I was concerned about those, uh, some of those more extreme examples that were provided. Um, and in terms of, you know, harming the university, but, you know, every way I read it, I couldn't really find that because in my reading, the, the really main change is saying that the chair shall attempt to convene the board if possible, right? And I don't know what the issue is there. In my reading of this, urgent approvals could actually proceed as they exist. All it would require is the chair making a determination and then later communicating that it was not feasible to to attempt that stuff. So, you know, to some of the examples provided by my colleagues, I would agree with Regent Rocha that they are covered in B. Um, if 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 a matter comes up, and and even attempting to 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 convene a quorum uh, to put out a notice, you know, because we do have. Uh, uh, special meetings and emergency meetings that have different procedures and things. If that's not even feasible, then you jump straight to to the urgent approvals as it exists. And quite frankly, I, I mean, I, I've never been part of an urgent approval process, but I would hope that it actually already goes this way, right? That you know, the president brings um, the the matter forward, and I would hope that the board chair, whoever it is, is already thinking well, is this something that we can actually get the board together on or do I need to continue and act on it right now? Um, so um, like, like I said, because of, of my um, sensitivity to, to some of the concerns that my colleagues have, I've tried to look at this every way and disagree with it. But I keep coming back to um, B that says, hey, if the board chair determines that the circumstances give rise to the, to the request, and do not permit any attempt, go ahead. Go ahead and do it just the way it's being done. Just come back to the board and let's have that discussion and, and explain to us why this process can be sought out. Again, I'll, I'll reiterate that I'd be surprised if this isn't already the way it goes just in practice of saying, of considering, does this actually need to be urgent or can we get the board? So for, for that reason, um, I, I think I, I support the resolution. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Regent Kenyanya. Let, let me just ask a question for um, Regent Davenport, who raised the concerns in the various examples. And that is, um, to, it, 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 to your point of time is of the, could, could be of the essence and that even the time to uh, formulate a statement to, to reach the board office, to have them try and convene a meeting, um, that could be precious time. You know, we're, we're trying to think of examples we always, We'll think of examples in extreme to make our point, but they happen and we know they happen. So in that first paragraph on the revised resolution, if that last sentence was deleted, that says if the board chair determines that immediate board action is necessary, then OBR shall attempt to contact all regents to assemble a quorum of the board for a meeting as soon as possible. If that was deleted and subparagraph A was deleted so that it went right to subparagraph B, would that address the concern that you've raised, Regent Davenport, and that I think others may share about not hamstringing the, the president and the chair in extraordinary circumstances? And if I could ask uh, Regent Davenport to respond, and then we'll go on to, uh, to hear from Regent Anderson and see where we are in the loop here. And I, I will tell you that we had 15 minutes set aside for this. So, of course, we're on a... Um, We've got uh, time constraints, but uh, I want to make sure we've properly vetted this. Uh, thank Regent you for Davenport. the question, Regent Mayron. Um, first, first look, uh, yes, that helps. Um, I want to take a look at it a little bit more and think about it, but um, initially I would say, uh, yes, that helps. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Regent Anderson. Re Regent Anderson, you're muted. Mute, there we go. Can you hear me now? 
Yes, yes, we can. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I um, I look at this and and I will just tell you briefly. I speak in favor of the motion, the the, the resolution. Um, much like Regent Kenyana, I think this is how we're doing things today. Um, and I think the one the one difference in this that I like, um, there is some responsibility for making a decision. Um, it's going to be post, but there, at times when urgent approvals have been made, I don't think we've had any problem, but some regions question it. And the difference I see in these motions is that uh, urgent approvals are now included as an information item at the next meet, scheduled meeting. And the new resolution says, at the next regular special meeting of the board following the approval, the urgent approval granted on behalf of the board to be presented to the board for ratification. Um, I think that gives some of my colleagues the opportunity for dissent. Uh, even if it's in hindsight, they have a forum to say, I didn't agree with that. I didn't agree with that. And, um, you know, the question might come, what if the majority did not agree with it? Uh, but I do think it gives regents a, a place to offer their dissent for something that was done. So that's that's my uh, take on it. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Anderson. Uh, Sarah, any other uh, individuals in line who have not yet spoken? Uh, Regent Beeson. All right, Regent Beeson. Unmuted. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, you know, it, it may make sense to delay this again. I, you know, I'd like to think about it. Uh, the, the fact that we're having the conversation is helpful. I, I do, I guess, lean toward Regent Davenport and Spigum's position uh, in that in, in my almost 12 years, uh, this provision has not been abused. It's seldom been invoked. And Time is really critical. We cannot create distractions when there is a true emergency. I'm really sensitive to that. And I, you know, I don't like um, reviewing amendments a couple hours before or a few minutes before and then an amendment to the amendment. So I don't think, I don't think it's wise to vote and ask you to delay it until February and, and we'll vote it up or down at that point. And I'll look at it again. Maybe I'll vote for it, but I, I, it feels like a steamroller over the anthill a little bit to me for the reasons I've said. I do, I mean, I do understand um, uh, it's a good conversation and I appreciate the time that's been put into it, but uh, I, I, it, things are moving a little too quickly now on it. Thank you, Regent Beeson. Uh, anybody else in the queue at this point? Uh, yes, Regent McMillan. All right, Regent McMillan. And and thank you. And Chair Mayron, and then Regent thank you. Davenport as well. And then Regent Davenport, come loop back to Davenport. Okay. All right, Regent McMillan. I'm uh I'm getting confused here on where the language stands with uh, with your interface with uh, Regent Mayron, or not Mayron, me your interface with uh, Regent Davenport. And uh, my, my, I spoke on this at length at the last meeting. Nothing's changed for me. We've got a, a, a very workable process now that, uh, that has not been misused. Never, never, I've never seen it misused in my time. And uh, I, I just, like Regent Beeson and a couple others, I'm, I'm just hesitant to insert another level of, uh, of process decision-making standards uh, where there's not a problem, but I'm open to change, but I, right now, I don't feel like I have a good grip on where we stand with changes that came this morning. And now you're talking about potentially removing another element of this. So I'd be much more comfortable waiting to do anything. Okay. Thank you very much, Regent McMillan. Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Mayron. I'm just circling back on your question to me. Um, in the removal of the, and <laughs> this complicates things again. Um, of course. Regent McMillan. Uh, but I would be agreeable to removing that last sentence in the first paragraph and A. I think that's what you were proposing. 
that is what I was testing to see if that would address the concern that you had um, uh, regarding not hamstringing the president or the chair if, when certain circumstances arose that required immediate action. Yes. Thank you. All right. Any further uh, discussion at this point? Any questions, discussion? Madam Chair? Yes, uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you. Um, all right. So, well, <clears throat> as, as the presenter of the motion, um, I'll, you know, I'll close out this the, the conversation. I so here here's here's the thing. You know, this has obviously been out for a number of months, and I'm I'm more dedicated to getting it right than necessarily getting it done fast. Um, in response to you know, it, it, it it's a bit awkward because the folks that are the strongest proponents that things have been done well are the ones that were doing them. Um, and, and, and it's the rest of us that, that were not part of those conversations. I, it, was, it was stated that there's not been a peep. Well, that's not true. Um, I've, I've asked the question about decisions that have been made and um, you know, when and, and why the rest of the board is not involved. And at a minimum, the, the presentation of this resolution is the peep. Um, the, the, the concern that I have is as I look at that list, I don't see a single library on fire. Um, virtually every one of them uh, would have provided an opportunity. You know, we've just this summer we've had meetings where we've received a call, and, and within a day we're we're conducting a meeting of the board and we're exercising the board's position. For those of us that are committed to, you know, yep. concepts like rule of law, uh, you have a constitution that vests the authority of this board in a board of twelve, and and in my view. In, in virtually every circumstance, um, except for those gravest of circumstances where it's not practical or not possible for the full board to be convened. And now with technology, it can be done very, very quickly. We should have fidelity to the state constitution and we should have fidelity to the fact that we reserve certain authorities to the board of regions, not to one or two regions, but to the board of regions. And, and we should we should seek to do that when, when that's the case. I, I find it quite remarkable that attempting to to include the full board in board decisions is is you know going to break the crimper. I mean, it, it's that's uh, I'm not really sure how to react to that. And 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 as far as you know, even interacting at the legislature, it's you know um, the legislative leadership is not authorized to pass laws without the full legislature, no matter what the circumstances are. So it, it's a it's a matter of keeping the board operating as a board. Um, and I think we, you know, I want to be mindful. Regent Rocha, I'm going to interrupt you for a moment. It, it sounded like uh, picking up on the earlier comment that you made that you're interested if we're going to do this and getting it right and not rushing it. And I'm wondering if it would make sense in light of the comments we've now received to table this discussion and bring it back in February uh, because People were seeing the revised resolution this morning, and then I made a comment to address Regent uh, Davenport's uh, concerns, and you haven't had an opportunity to respond. I'm wondering if it, uh, to those, to the deletion of certain language of your resolution, would you be open to tabling this discussion and, and presenting it back uh, for uh, the vote on uh, at the February governance meeting. Well, here, my, my problem, thank you, Madam Chair. My, my concern is that I think it's more strategic than that. I don't, you know, if I thought it was in good faith, I, I, I do think that the, the, the language that is, that is being objected to, um, the, the idea that the board office would seek to attempt, would seek to convene the board to be part of decisions that are reserved to the board of regents. Uh, I don't think that there's anything offensive about that language. I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, it, because it specifically provides if the board chair determines that it's not possible to, to, to make that attempt that the board chair, uh, vice chair and committee chair are authorized just as they are now. Um, that, that I don't, there's really nothing obscure about that language. So it would seem, you know, it would seem that this is you know, reasonable in, in its face, on its face rather. And I, you know, it would seem that I mean, we, we've already had, you know, we, we pushed it back once already. So it would seem to make sense to um, to proceed with it as it is. I mean, we do have the, if, if there is something highly offensive about the language, you know, certainly any other member of the board could, could you know, move clearer language or better language at a later date. We're not pre prevented from doing that. All right. So thank you. Thank you very much. Let me ask a point of clarification, Mr. Steves. 
um, if if a motion is going to can as chair, uh, may I make a motion uh, to amend this uh, policy? I assume I probably can, but I thought I should check or the re a proposed uh, resolution. Um, Madam Chair, it, it's uh, not typical that a chair makes a motion, but certainly it is it is permitted. All right. Well, what the heck? All right. I'm going to uh, move then to amend the resolution to delete the last sentence of the first paragraph, which reads, if the board chair determines that immediate board action is necessary, then OBR shall attempt to contact all regions to assemble a quorum of the board for a meeting as soon as possible. And as part of my motion to amend the resolution to delete subparagraph A, which reads, if a quorum of the board is available, the board chair shall call a special or emergency meeting to act on the president's request. And then the process you know, light, laid out in B would uh, remain. Uh, so that is my motion. I'm making it in order to address, I think the points, the good points that have been made by uh, Regent uh, Davenport uh, to make sure that we are not uh, interjecting any required steps to be made uh, before the chair along with the vice chair and the committee uh, chair could take urgent uh, action or uh, urgent approval if necessary. So that is my motion. I assume I need a second for that. Is that correct, Mr. Steves? Yes. Second. All right. Is the, and then Mr. Steves, is there discussion on the amended motion or how do we proceed on that? There should be. Yes. All no, right, yeah. then. Then uh, just wanted to verify. So uh, the amended motion is before you. Uh, any comments and discussion on this motion? Madam Ma Chair? Yeah. Yes. Uh, before you made your motion, we did have three other speakers. I'll let you know who they were before you proceed right. making new speakers on, on this motion. So the previous speakers were Regents Kenyanya, Shu, and McMillan. And now Regent Rocha has also raised his hand. And so that's the four who are currently awaiting an opportunity to speak. Ma Madam Chair, I just simply was, was going to ask if we could have the language you know, kind of read through to that point, because I'm not entirely clear. I'm sorry, the language of the. Yeah, I mean, if, you if, want if, me you want me to read it again from hmm. the screen, what I would be deleting, I'm proposing be de deleted. Yes, if you would, please. All right. In the first paragraph of the red line version before us, the last sentence of the first full paragraph. Thank you. And I, I see I have an arrow pointing to it. Wonderful. If, you, if it's possible to highlight it, that'd be great. Uh, it starts with if the board, there we go. Okay. We now have it highlighted. That's the language I'm proposing be deleted by my motion that has been seconded by Regent Davenport. And then the uh, subparagraph B would become, uh, I don't know if it will become A or a uh, separate paragraph. We can figure that out separately. So a point of information, Madam Chair. Um, so what I'm under, under trying to understand then is under what circumstances would the board chair convene a quorum of the board if possible? Because this would it only would go to B. It would go to right. B if the board chair determines the circumstances giving rise to the president's request for urgent approval do not permit any attempt to contact all regions or if a quorum is not attainable prior to this uh, extraordinary event, then the chair the chair could act at that point with the vice chair and the committee chair. So, but, but this, this, so it does not contain a, any specific language requiring first a, a seeking to convene a, a quorum of the board. It does not, it would not, it would leave it to the board chair to determine whether under B, the proposed language you've put in, whether a quorum could be obtained or whether a, a, there is time to contact all the regions. And just, so my view is that that was embedded within B but it also gives the board chair the opportunity to say, we don't have time to do any of this. So I'm not gonna require OBR shall make an attempt to contact everyone. 
it'll gives that flexibility to the board chair. Uh, understood, but would that wouldn't that be accomplished by simply removing the portion that says OBR shall attempt to contact all regions, just go from if the board chair determines immediate board action is necessary, then the following applies. A, if a quorum is available, call quorum, and B, if it's not available, can act. Um, I was trying to address Regent Davenport's concern. It may be possible a quorum is available, but there may not be time to make that determination. So I was trying to address the extraordinary events that she raised as concern. I think now we're getting into where you, that uh, I think you're hearing from your colleagues that the chair goes through that exercise mentally anyway to determine is there time. But that was my point of you don't have to make that determination if you don't have time to make that determination. That was the reason for it. I hope that clarifies. I do feel that we need to move on to the other regents at this time. Chair Mayra? Yes. If I could also let you know that regents Her and Beeson have added their raised hands. All right. Um, great. So I'm trying to, I need some uh, direction here probably from um, Mr. Steves, in terms of timing, uh, obviously we have other items on the agenda. I know we have people in waiting um, on the uh, policy with respect to uh, alcohol and also the uh, board assessment. So, and I also know our meeting does not, uh, when our meeting ends, the board meeting will begin. So uh, my question for you is I'm looking for some guidance here. We have some significant discussion here now on this. Uh, uh, as to the best way to proceed. Madam Chair, um, given, given the timing, the time being devoted to this conversation, which is valuable and important, uh, and uh, the, the, the next item, which is a review of uh, a policy change, um, I guess my recommendation at this point in time would be to try to finish this conversation and then take up and do the review of the, the the policy related to alcoholic beverages, and then um, and then postpone the the board. review or discussion of the board assessment options because that can ha that's not time sensitive. It can happen at a at a subsequent meeting. All right, I think we'll proceed in that fashion then. Uh, so I believe Sarah, the next person is Regent Kenyanya, correct? Yes, it is. All right, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you, colleagues, for the for the discussion. Uh, it, so maybe I'm reading this incorrectly, but what what is being what the things that are being accomplished by the 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 amendment already could happen because the chair could jump to B and determine not all not even that a quorum is not available, but that an attempt to contact regents is is not is not reasonable. Um, maybe maybe I'm reading B incorrectly, but the way I read it, this can actually be accomplished in that in that I, I do agree that there may be a situation where going through that process might be enough of a delay to you know to to cause the the harm. But even in that situation, I think I, if I'm reading B correctly, all that's being asked of the chair is to pause and say, is there even is there time to even go through this. And if they determine that there's not, they can continue with the process um, as it exists. So, I mean, for that reason, I, I don't know why the amendment would be necessary, but if um, I think if that helps more colleagues um, get there, you know, and we still add the, the, the requirement of the ratification and whatnot, then um, I could support this. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And just to clarify, the reason I propose deleting that last sentence of the first paragraph is that because it says, then OBR shall attempt to contact regents to assemble a quorum of the board for a meeting as soon as possible. That's in the preamble paragraph there. So I'm reading that, that the chair makes the determination, the chair contacts OBR, the OBR tries to get a quorum together, and then A or B kick in. Um, and that was the reason I proposed deleting that last sentence because that takes time. And that I think that was 
Regent Davenport's concern. Why don't I go ahead and we'll move to Regent Chu and Regent Kenyanya after you had a chance to oh, look at that I, sentence again. Uh, Madam Chair, if I may. Yes. Uh, actually, your last point kind of made sense. And I think it's similar to what Regent Rosha was saying before. It, the we could only we could delete half of that last sentence, right? If the board chair determines that immediate action is necessary, then jump to either A or B, determine uh, depending on the circumstance. Um, I don't know if, if that's clear, but I think that's what Regent Rosha was suggesting before, and I think it's kind of what you uh, iterated there. But I'll um, I'll let others speak. Thank you, Manager. All right, great. Thank you for that comment. Good point. All right, uh, Regent Shu. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my my point would just be that uh, <clears throat> we get notifications all the time when a crime is committed or whatever. I mean, call it a bad signal, whatever you want. Um, we we are um, most likely available if there is something critical that needs to occur. Um, but most of the things are not that critical. And I think what Darren is, uh, what Regent Roche is trying to um, do here is just to make sure that the uh, the regions um, as a whole, the board as a whole, which is what the constitution says, uh, should be um, allowed to, um, to weigh in on certain issues um, in, in uh, you know, if you look at that list, there are things that all, in any one of those things on that list that uh, we were shown uh, a couple of meetings ago uh, are things that we could have all been um, asked about, or we could have had a meeting. We could have, there was a lot of things that could happen. I mean, the telephone was invented over a hundred years ago and um, boards have been uh, doing that, including the board of regents have been um, doing that for, for many years. So I, I just think that uh, what Regent Rosha is trying to achieve is in order to have uh, good and proper governance um, on this board, uh, that the board chair should contact or make an attempt to contact regents um, whenever an issue arises that uh, that would require region approval. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Regent Shu. Regent McMillan. Thank you, uh, Chair Mayoron. I, I, here's where I'm at. So I came into the meeting about where I was last time. And I just want to be clear that I'm not opposed to this on some strategic ground or because I, I can't see any value to change. I'm, I'm warming up to the idea that, that several regents feel defeased or disenfranchised by use of this. And, and I think I might even find a way to getting to a point where I could support a change. I might even support removing the emergency power altogether rather than going through a tortured process that this is starting to feel like. But where I stand right in this moment is I am honestly confused. I don't, I don't understand fully, and I hate to make a quick decision around language that feels like it's moving on me, and it is moving. And that's okay. But a delay at this point would not be because I, I, I'm, I'm addressing Regent Rocha specifically now. I'm not delaying because I have a strategic purpose of killing this forever. I am warming up to the idea and understanding that not all regents, and especially those who haven't been in leadership roles, don't feel great about this when it's used, even if it's used properly. But before we alter it and change it or pull it out entirely, which honestly, I would understand what I'm doing then, this I really... As a past chair, it's a little confusing to me how it would operate. I just want to be sure. So if I vote no today, if we go to a vote, it isn't because I'm forever opposed to the idea of this change. It's because I don't know what I'm voting on. And I would keep what we have before I would vote on that. And I did try to do my homework ahead of time. So not like I came in today without any sense of it. But I, I really need to think about the changes that have occurred twice now since the last meeting. And... Uh, and, and I will commit that if we do hold off, I would be open and learning when it comes to should we have emergency approval powers. And if we have them, 
what exactly are the strictures under which they'll be applied. I think that's clear today, but I realize a growing number of regions don't, and I'm open and learning when it comes to figuring out how we make sure everybody feels enfranchised here. Thank you. Thank you, Regent McMillan. Um, I know that Regent uh, Rocha is back in, uh, is in the queue again, but uh, I'm going to exercise my prerogative and call on Regent Herr, who has not had an opportunity to speak, and then we'll come back to Regent Rocha and Regent Beeson. Regent Herr. Yes, Madam Chair. I think uh, Regent McMillan said what I was feeling um, and where I am at right now, because one, I am really confused about the discussion and where it's going and where the amendment, where this whole resolution amendment is at. Um, and it really gets down to the heart of our own um, urgent approval authority and how we delegate it. So to me, our discussion gets back to the point of, of, of negating what we're trying to do. So I'm really confused. The question is at the heart is, what are we trying to fix? What are we trying to do? Um, are we not happy with the approval? Or are we just not happy with the decision that happens after um, the approval of, of, the, of incidents that have, have happened in the past? So, um, so it gets down to the heart of, should we even have, <clears throat> have urgent approval? And if we do, what's the process around it? Um, and then it comes to the, the whole issue of <clears throat> here we are, the board, here we are just discussing this amendment. It's, it's taken us all this time, and it kind of negates the need for the urgent approval process in and of itself anyway. So um, where I am right now, I tend to not to be in support of, of anything at this point. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Regent Rocha. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. On, on the amendment itself, I so, you, you know, I, I think Regent Kenyanya captured it well, uh, but at the same time, um, along with him, uh, my sense is that, well, my, you know, it's not my preference, but if, as the chair has indicated, that it is it is in included within the uh, the portion of B that that if circumstances giving rise don't permit an opportunity, that that means that if they do, that you would con uh, convene a quorum. And that that addresses Region Davenport's concern and, and you know and, and gets us to a a better place. I think it you know the the remaining portion is uh, you know our improvements to being clear. Um, it, you know I, I I have a lot of faith in, in my colleagues to be able to address these concerns. Um, you know I I don't want to say on the fly. I mean last month I asked for some time to consider a massive change in the proposal to cut sports. Um, that I was denied that opportunity to consider that massive change that had occurred moments before the meeting started. And, uh, and yet um, the, the two previous speakers were comfortable making a decision based on uh, uh, that change without having that time. I, I think that in, under these circumstances, um, the language is pretty clear. The process is pretty clear um, that when, the, you know, I, I don't agree that we shouldn't have an, an urgent approval uh, issue. The only, an alternative would be to grant broader authority to address, um, you, you know, major health and safety issues and, and, and library collections and so on to, to the administration under those circumstances. I think that having the, the, the board leadership involved when it's absolutely impossible to convene a quorum of the board is a good policy to have. And, and, and this, this provides that, but it also places the centrality of, of our operation as a full board um, when at all possible. And that, that's why I think that that this should pass. Um, I can I can live with the amendment proposed by the chair um, to the extent that it clarifies that if if there is time that a quorum will be pre presented and then the remaining provisions would apply. And I, I so I would I would be comfortable with adopting the the amendment she's proposed and then passing the the main resolution. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, Regent Beeson. Thank you very much, Regent Rocha. Uh, Madam Chair. I I, I would ask you and the author to um, withdraw the the amendment and the the, the, the motion um, respectfully. And uh, I think we can commit to taking a vote on this in February. I would ask that the, the two of you, along with the chair, who's not here and is not able to participate in this, uh, nor have we heard from the administration, that, that, that you try to get together over the next two months 
work through some language. There probably is a way to do this, but to do drafting on the fly in the back of a napkin an hour before the meeting and then scribbling stuff out, it, it's really not the way to do this. And it's, while this is not unimportant, um, it's not urgent at all. And so I would ask both of you to do that with a commitment we just vote on it in whatever form, either that you bring it together with or or separately. We'll do that. Would you be willing to make a motion to table this discussion till the February meeting? So moved. Is there a second? Seconded. Uh, second. I take it we go right to a vote, Mr. Steves, on the motion to table? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. All right, and does that motion need to be a roll call vote then? It does. All right, would you do the call the roll, please? Madam Chair, I'll call the roll. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. On the motion to table, uh, Regent Anderson. Yes. Regent Anderson votes yes. Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Hurd. Yes. Regent Hurd votes yes. Regent Shu. No. Regent Shu votes no. Regent Kenyanya. Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent McMillan. Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Powell is absent. Regent Rosha. Yes. Regent Rosha votes yes. Regent Simonson. Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swiggum. Regent Swiggum. Uh, Chair Mayron. Yes. Oh, Regent Swiggum. Yes, Regent Swiggum, uh, and I vote yes. Regent Swiggum votes yes. Uh, Regent uh, Chair Mayron votes yes. Uh, Madam Chair, there are <clears throat> 10 yes votes, one no vote, and one absent. Thank you. We, this matter will be tabled uh, and presented for discussion in February. I think this was an excellent discussion uh, and gets, I think, to the heart of some important issues here on how we conduct ourselves. So uh, we will confer and get back to you in February. Thank you. At this time, uh, our next item for review is the proposed amendments to the Board of Regents policy for alcoholic beverages on campus. Here to provide us with an overview of the amendments are President Gable and Vice President Kramer. Uh, President Gable, would you like to start? Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Vice Chair Shu, members of the committee. The purpose of this item is to review proposed amendments for two policies to provide the sale and licenses and sponsorship rights for alcoholic beverage manufacturers. Vice President for University Relations, Matt Kramer is here. He'll highlight how the landscape of higher education, alcohol licensing and sponsorship has changed over recent years, including for the university to pursue relationships with alcohol manufacturers statewide to advance alternative revenue opportunities benefiting the university and our alumni. Members of the committee, the current board policy effectively precludes the university from entertaining these types of relationships and revenue streams. Of note, there are only two other schools in the Big Ten that prohibit alcohol beverage licensing and sponsorships. On the other hand, if we were to affirmatively pursue these avenues, the annual revenue opportunity for Gother Athletics alone is estimated at $300,000 per year. Not to mention the possibility for students, faculty, staff, and alums who do research into the related crops, who are entrepreneurs or innovative um, uh, business people in this space with whom we may wish to partner. Madam Chair, at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Vice President Kramer for a deeper dive into these amendments. Thank you. Thank you, President Gable. Vice President Kramer. Thank you, Madam Chair and members, and thank you for this opportunity to present this proposed alcohol policy recommendation. Next slide, please. As the president noted, this recommendation would amend two, of you, two University of Minnesota policies that pertain to the sale of licenses and sponsorship rights to alcohol beverage manufacturers. Next slide, please. The first is a Board of Regents policy. As the president noted, and I draw your attention to the first sentence, this makes it very easy for us today because when we're approached by entrepreneurs, particularly small craft brewers, about working with them, we simply say the university shall not accept. So this is a very powerful statement in eliminating any, any ambiguity. Next slide, please. 
The other policy is an administrative policy that you have delegated to the administration. And in turn, the president requests that university relations, university relations enforce this. And this relates to trademarks, logos, colors, and seals. And I would draw your attention to the second half of this paragraph where there are a number of uses that we explicitly prohibit the use of any university trademarks with. Next slide, please. So what has changed and why we would consider this? Next slide, please. Of course, one of the things that anyone or no one will be surprised of is the rise of the craft entrepreneur in this space. And I would add now that while so often we default to beer, this covers the entire spectrum. So it could be distilled spirits. It could be wine with the university's cold hardy grapes. It could be ciders with the apples that we have patented. And it certainly could be other products, including beer. We've seen this movement in a way that changes the landscape. And many of these small businesses are either alumni owned or are hiring our alumni. And of course, within the university itself, we've seen increased interest from students in exploring this as an entrepreneurial space. Next slide, please. As the president noted, there is revenue associated with this. And increasingly, we're all challenged at look for opportunities that are not linked to either state support or tuition. Next slide, please. What has not changed? There are two principal things I'd like to address. Next slide, please. The first relates to the size of this industry. When you turn the television on or you're listening on Sunday afternoon to, for example, a National Football League game, you may hear an alcoholic beverage commercial. The distinction there is it is a very large market. And while individuals may root for a different team or be a fan of a different team, the beverage is the same across the entire country. It's very different in the collegiate space. And I draw your attention to the lower right hand corner. So for example, if this was a billboard and Ohio State was advertising along with, or Coors Light was advertising in the Ohio State market, we would presumably never see this billboard in Minnesota because it wouldn't make marketing sense. And that's one of the challenges in the collegiate sports. It is very local at best statewide with some drift over the edges of the state. So the individual or the market is big, but the individual opportunities are relatively small. Next slide, please. Of course, the other thing that has not changed is an extraordinarily strong emphasis on responsible drinking. This is a result of many, many years of not only state, rec state regulations, public pressure, but also risk management on the part of manufacturers. And I'm happy to say that even in our limited discussion with potential alcohol beverage manufacturers, they all to a, to a business stress responsible drinking. Next slide, please. I'd like to give you a quick landscape of our work today in licensing and sponsorship. So we work, the University of Minnesota works with a company called Learfield IMG. They used to be two separate companies. They merged a couple of years ago. They in turn have a subsidiary company called Collegiate Licensing Company that manages our license of use of trademarks. So if you go into a department store or the University of Minnesota bookstore on any of the campus and you're buying a sweatshirt that has the block M on it, or one of the other trademarks. It has gone through CLC. Next slide, please. Together, Learfield IMG represents over 200 higher education partners around the country. And they tell us that today, more than 130 of those already allow for alcohol licensing and sponsorship. Next slide, please. And of course, as the president noted, within the Big Ten, there are only three institutions today that do not have alcohol sponsorship or licensing. Penn State, the University of Wisconsin, and the University of Minnesota. Next slide, please. To give you a quick example of licensing, so licensing is when a licensee obtains the right to use one of our marks. And you see a number of examples here using the University of Iowa, and in particular, the Hawkeye. I'd like to pause for a moment and address that because in our consultation with both faculty and student groups, the concern about, and I wanna address this very directly, Goldie Gopher has come up. So the Iowa Hawkeye is a stylized logo. Goldie Gopher is a gopher, and Goldie Gopher appears lots of places in person. It is totally within our rights to restrict which marks we would have potentially use. So while I've heard some concerns about would Goldie Gopher appear on a can, that is within our capacity to decide whether we would allow that or not. Next slide, please. Sponsorship is the other element to this. And here you'll see the example and the arrow points to official sponsor of the Texas Longhorns. So a business associates themselves with a given part of the university. Next slide, please. As the president noted, in talking to Learfield IMG and our other Big Ten colleagues, we believe the revenue opportunity is approximately $300,000 a year. And that would be for the Twin Cities campus. Next slide, please. The important thing about this opportunity is that it actually pertains to all of our campuses. However, it's important to note that because this is market driven, the elements of the market, population, market penetration, media outlets, diminishes significantly when you leave the Twin Cities. 
And so while Learfield IMG believes that Duluth, for example, might be in the range of 75 to 100,000 on the high end, Rochester is a special case because they don't have any sports teams. And Morrison Crookston, there are opportunities there, but they have the disadvantage of being relatively close to larger markets in the case of Fargo and Grand Forks. Next slide, please. In talking to our colleagues across the Big Ten and Learfield, we came up with a number of business models that seem to be the prevailing business model. I'd like to step through the three principal ones and then provide you with our recommendation. Next slide, please. The first model maximizes your revenue. So you would put out an RFP and you would say, we wanna deal with one of the large manufacturers. And these are the two largest in the United States right now. This maximizes your revenue because you're guaranteeing exclusivity across the entire state of Minnesota. The disadvantage to this is it now means that you can't work with all those entrepreneurial small craft brewers around the state that regularly have asked to work with us. Next slide, please. The alternative then is 180 degrees to that. These examples, by the way, are nothing more than examples. So I, I wanna stress the logos are up there only for familiarity. This model works with local brewers, distillers, vintners across the state, and it has the advantage of lots of partnerships. It has the disadvantage of reducing the revenue to the University of Minnesota, because for many of these companies, particularly very small ones, their ability to both sponsor or pay for licensing rights is relatively modest. Next slide, please. To, to no one's surprise, there is a model that combines the two. You offer a degree of exclusivity. So you say, we're gonna give you statewide rights, you can bring your competitive power to the table, but we're also gonna allow smaller participants to enter into the marketplace. This is essentially what they're dealing with today. So you get a degree of revenue on the big company side, but you also allow for participation from Minnesota companies. Next slide, please. And indeed that is our recommendation. As we look across the big 10, invariably, no matter where they start, they end up on this model. So our thought is why not just start at the end? Next slide, please. I'd like to step now through how licensing and sponsorship would work. Next slide, please. I mentioned that licensing is our mark on a product. Our chief marketing officer, Ann Aronson, and her team provide very explicit instructions to CLC on how our mark is used. And as we look at these examples, and again, these are nothing more than examples, we would envision exactly the same. We specify our color, our size, how it is used, et cetera. So it's relatively straightforward. Next slide, please. Importantly, the advantage of licensing in this particular case is it does allow for, and I'm gonna use this only for sake of uh, argument, if there was a small craft brewer in Morris, Crookston or Duluth, they may have the ability to distribute their product only a very small area. So we could craft a license agreement that would only be for one of those communities or the geography that they serve. Again, limited revenue for the University of Minnesota, but participation and support of one of our institutions. Next slide, please. Importantly, across the board, we are not going to promise exclusivity. So while the opportunity may exist to maximize revenue, from our perspective, one of the important things is participation by Minnesota companies. Next slide, please. Last spring, the University of Minnesota through University of Relations was approached by a, a student group out of CFANS that wanted to create a student manufactured beer. Now, this is not coincidental. The hops in the background are hops patented, a hybrid hops patented by the University of Minnesota. They wanted to create a student-led beer that would have been manufactured by a third party, so a, one of the brewers here in town, but they wanted to brand it with University of Minnesota. We obviously had to tell them we cannot do that today. Next slide. In the case of this, you would have that ability to say, now we can work with student groups. And perhaps at some point, there might even be a student brew house on campus or something like that, or a vinter or cider manufacturer on the Arboretum campus out in Chaska. Importantly, if we ever had production on campus, it would have to be approved by the Board of Regents. And of course, the state would have to be involved because only the state can license alcoholic manufacturers. Next slide, please. Let's take a quick look at how sponsorships work. Next slide, please. One element of sponsorship is exactly what you see here, advertising. So you're in one of our venues and you see an ad, in this case, Xfinity or Allianz. This is very straightforward. We do this today, obviously, all the time. Next slide, please. The other aspect of this, and we touched on this earlier, is sponsorship, where a company wishes to be associated with the University of Minnesota. And here you see an example with Affinity Plus, proud sponsor of Gopher Athletics. Or if you're familiar with Cub Foods, they have a campaign during the fall selling tailgating material, and they are a proud sponsor of Gopher Athletics. Next slide, please. Let's talk about the next steps. Next slide, please. 
the appearance of the football here is not coincidental. On a national basis, the largest market for this particular space is collegiate football. So for the last several months, working with Gopher Athletics and our partners, we have been doing consultation with faculty student groups. All of the campuses are aware of this. We are presenting today to get your feedback. Should you choose to ask us to take this forward and vote in the affirmative in February, we would work with Learfield IMG to prepare an RFP. Assuming we chose that hybrid Model 3, we would select a national vendor. That would essentially, if you think of it as a mall, would be our anchor tenant, somebody to help get us started. The important thing about all of this is it's curious. You know, we all think of the act of consumption for the manufacturers. It's also about the goods. It's about going into a bar or restaurant and having a glass with a logo on it, posters, all of those associated things. In those particular cases, that means you must work backwards a couple of months to be able to manufacture those and distribute those across the markets. So choose a national vendor, start bringing on local vendors, but in any case, prepare for a launch in fall of 2021. Next slide, please. Thank you for this opportunity to present and I'd be happy to take any questions, Madam Chair. Thank you for uh, a wonderful presentation and concise and uh, I really appreciate it. At this time, I would open the topic up for discussion by any of my colleagues. Uh, Sarah, who do we have on tap here? Chair Mayron, we have Regents Beeson, Shu, and Simonson. All right, thank you, Regent Beeson. Madam Chair, uh, thank you, um, Mr. Kramer. This issue certainly has evolved over the years. I remember when we opened the stadium in 2009, alcohol was reserved for the suites, and you can imagine what the reaction was in the bowl, and a certain legislator who's now passed, short in height, but tall in, um, in uh, his lung uh, um, uh, tone, passed a law that, that forced us uh, to uh, sell alcohol throughout the stadium. You know, the fear was that this would become sort of a Philadelphia's e Philadelphia Eagles sort of drunken bash on campus. We didn't know, we were conservative, but I think it's been our fans and our students have been responsible. Uh, and I think adding this uh, while it's, I have some concerns, I think it's, I don't think it will increase the risk by any real amount uh, and I would support the resolution and the program, which is well balanced and well conceived. Thank you. Thank you very much, Regent Beese. And I believe you said, Ms. Dirksen, that Regent Shu was up next. Is that correct? Yes. And yeah. Chair Mayron, also uh, Regents McMillan, Kenyanya, and Rosha have added their names. All right. Regent Shu, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, presenter. Kramer, um, I think this is a very interesting topic. I, I did really want to see a policy uh, at least start to come forward in this area this year. Um, I I'm, am concerned about the small amount of money that um, you talked about. 300000 is a paltry sum. Um, we canceled three sports for $1.2 million a year. So uh, I, I really, I think there's some issues with um, the analysis that was done. Um, I'm, I think we need to do a deeper dive into understanding what um, some of our peers are doing. You listed University of Michigan as one of the ones that had approved uh, a similar policy, but my understanding is they have limitations. For example, you you will not see alcohol in inside their stadium. So, uh, I think that's really where the the you know, the rubber needs to meet the road in, in terms of uh, what the limitations are. I also think that your presentation was heavily focused on beer, uh, but obviously there's hard liquors um, also that uh, could uh, be responding to, to your RFP. So uh, I, I would like to see a little bit more analysis in terms of um, what some of the limitations might be. Um, the it's, it, it is obvious that you know, we had a discussion yesterday about uh, mental health and alcohol and marijuana. Uh, obviously, as I said yesterday, marijuana is not legalized in this state, but if it were, you know, we'd be considering a policy to potentially market marijuana in, in our stadiums as well. So I, I'm just a little bit concerned about where we draw the line here. I don't know exactly what the consultation was. I think you mentioned some, or I've heard um, 
from other people that uh, there has been some consultation with faculty and staff and students, and I'm not sure where that is. Uh, and you know, we do have, we are surrounded by advertising everywhere we go. Um, and of course the Minnesota Daily has no restrictions on whether they can um, affect or uh, have alcohol uh, in their advertisements. Uh, so I guess, unless there's more money involved, I'm, I'm not sure I support this, um, but uh, also, uh, we need to we need to look at what the uh, uh, what the fan base will support. I'm not sure. I mean, I've already received some communications and complaints based on the uh, Star Tribune article that came out. So I, I'm looking for a little bit more um, understanding of some of the limitations that we would have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vice President Kramer. Did you want to respond to any of the comments that uh, Regent Shu raised? Uh, perhaps on. Um, uh, you might want to address who has been consulted in terms of the development of this policy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> the number of groups that we have consulted with is actually in your docket. It's part of the submission on this. We did add, excuse me one moment. <coughs> we did it. <coughs> we added, <coughs> good grief. We added the professional student group uh, just prior to the Board of Regents earlier this week. In terms of the revenue, I'm afraid the revenue is what it is, to use the phrase. Uh, this is a very large market nationally, but because the hyper-local or the hyper-local approach to sports uh, of collegiate at the collegiate level means fans typically are watching a team only for their market. So it isn't that somebody in Minnesota, although obviously we have lots of them, is supporting Notre Dame or Ohio. It's that the, for the people marketing to them, they're going for the people who are going to purchase their product. And then finally, I would note that as uh, Regent Shu did indicate, this is a product that is sold today. And the same fan who might be concerned about the University of Minnesota participating in alcohol licensing and sponsorship is seeing ads for alcohol on TV while watching a Gophers game. Thank you, Vice President Kramer. Our next uh, comment uh, discussion, Regent Simonson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Vice President Kramer. Um, I'm certainly interested in alternative sources of the revenue, as you've heard me say many times. And I agree with Regent Sue, this is not a whole lot, 300. And I'd rather put a big focus on stuff that we talked about with uh, uh, Vice President Kramer yesterday. Um, uh, but uh, my concern here is the image for the view. Um, you know, we're looking at, at advertising with, with possible, with our logos on that. And as the advertising are the target students. And again, as Re Regent Chu, we had this conversation yesterday in the student wellness discussion about students with alcohol problems. I've gotten some emails uh, regarding this issue from former students and parents concerned about that. Uh, what's, what's the new stand? You know, we're in favor of alcohol. I mean, I'm not against somebody drinking beer, but we've got a significant problem. And I can't remember what a 15% of the students, and then as we talked yesterday, it related to other stuff. So I right now um, have a hard time understanding why we want to go down this route. It's really not a big alternative for us, and it does negatively affect the image of the university, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Simonson. Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Mayor. On a um, couple of thoughts here. I I am glad to see us getting this, this, this policy on the table and having the conversation occurring today and I appreciate uh, Vice President Kramer bringing it forward. I, uh, I have a couple concerns. One is that we don't end up with a, if we think about our portfolio of advertisers and, and parties that want to associate themselves with the block M, certainly we want to maximize the revenue that comes from that. And it could be the, you know, the UMD logo. It could be any other thing. We, we want community businesses to be engaged with us. And I share the concern and it doesn't seem like much money. I don't have, I say that without knowing how much it's worth to have a hot dog vendor or, you know, Hormel selling hot dogs at our football games too. And, so what I wouldn't want to see is that we end up with alcohol sort of crowding out all the rest of the products, services, you mentioned affinity, whatever the, the company or the brand is, 
we want to be seen to the Minnesotans as being supported by a whole range of businesses and not just uh, booze manufacturers or beer man or beer brewers. So that concern sits there with me. And, and maybe this is so small, as we say, 300,000, it'll never happen because maybe the hot dog and the banks pay a lot more. I know what Rick will, you know, but Regent Beeson will pay lots for advertising. So um, just a little humor there. Sorry. So that's one <laughs> concern. Maybe, maybe between now and next month or in February, we can Very learn cool. a little more about it. Um, second concern is that I hope that there's been extensive con consultation, even though the markets are small, that uh, we did engage Duluth in particular because they do have D1 sports with a pretty significant regional reach up there, especially in hockey. And I don't just mean the sports side of it. I hope the campus was included too and campus leadership. And that would be true for Morris, Crookston, and Rochester as well, given the point that Regent Simonson just made, and that is, you know, how do our students handle alcohol on all our different campuses. Is everything the same? Is there a problem everywhere? Do some campuses have different modes for for, uh, for dealing with it? And then of course, in Duluth's case, they, they, uh, they're they the primary tenant at, at a publicly owned, uh, you know, municipal or a regionally owned arena. So I, uh, I'm i sure that, that Josh Burlow and his team were included, but I hope that uh, the whole administration on the other campuses was included as to how we deal with students. So those are my two concerns. I'm, I, I'm notionally supportive at this point, but, but I guess I was surprised by the amount of money there too. And uh, we want to think long and hard before we jump in for that much money. But my, my instincts tell me this is probably the direction to go, assuming as long as we get all the parts and pieces right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Regent McMillan. Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair uh, and VP Kramer uh, for the information and presentation. Um, yeah, I mean, most of my comments are similar to those before. Um, you know, this is timely coming after yesterday's presentation um, from Vice Provost Anderson and Vice Chancellor Olson Loy about um, high risk drinking on our campuses. Um, you know, so we definitely have to weigh those concerns at the same time when we talk about our budget, whether it's the university budget or, or, or specific budgets within the university, you know, we're always stressing to the administration to pursue revenue gen generating activities, right? Um, rather than always, in addition to cutting costs. And this is one of them. So I think because of that, it deserves a look. I too was a bit surprised um, by the, the relatively uh, small amount um, uh, of revenue, I mean, revenue is revenue, but um, I, I expect it to be higher. I, I first heard about this from a colleague before I had a chance to read the docket and my mind jumped to the Coke contract, um, which obviously is different because we're actually selling on campus. So I don't know why I conflated those two, but the revenue is just um, relatively small. So it just deserves consideration in terms of what, if it's worth it, right? Um, additionally, um, I think, we can agree that, you know, we wouldn't want to be targeting students or on campus, um, um, places on campus outside of, you know, athletics and other appropriate um, activities. And then also I would, um, I'd like to see us consider, if we were to move forward with this, to consider um, setting aside a portion of those revenues. And I don't know where they'd go, but specifically to combat High risk drinking on campus, whether it's education or recovery efforts or or Boynton or the various health services on, on the campuses, but set aside at X percent. I won't make something up. Whatever is reasonable um, to to help you know deal with that on our campuses and support our students um, that that um, are affected by this. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Regent Kenyanya. Any response uh, that you wanted to make, Vice President Kramer, to the comments? thus far, or by in particular by Regent Kenyanya in terms of uh, uh, dedicating certain of the revenues uh, for uses such as he outlined. And I do have uh, just a question for you. We talk about revenues, but do we uh, take into account the expenses of managing this program? In other words, does the net to us 
I assume less than 300,000. And have we looked at what, at the end of the day, what's going to go to our bottom line? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, I'll, perhaps I'll go uh, to Regent uh, Kenya on your first and then come back to you. But I would like to make a global comment. Um, I have uh, no hesitancy in saying I was equally surprised at the limited degree of revenue associated with it. I went into this with a, a national scope and in talking to our Big Ten colleagues, this is right in the market size for what we would expect to get. Um, I do appreciate the comments that, you know, a dollar is a dollar. And if there's an opportunity to add to our bottom line, we should at least consider it. With respect to how the money should be divided, I would simply say that's not my decision. But I think that looking at um, different models, I am aware of some of our Big Ten colleagues who do exactly that. They carve off a portion of the revenue associated with it and say, you know, we would like to use this for either responsible drinking or mental health, whatever the case may be. I have I certainly have no objection to that, and that seems like a pretty straightforward response. Um, and then uh, I apologize, Madam Chair, I forgot your question at the end. Mine was that you talk about revenue of approximately 300,000, but I assume there are costs associated with starting up the program, managing and managing it. So when we talk, we're already talking limited dollars, What's the, what are we anticipating the net will be after those expenses? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. In this particular case, the good news is we contract with Learfield IMG and CLC for their services. And so they're taking this on, you could almost say they're taking this on pro bono, although they're not, because they get a cut of this. And so they take their cut, the 300,000 is after the fact what we get. The cost of starting this up are building that RFP for which I would envision that there would be a group across the university, obviously including the general counsel's office, building the RFP, evaluating the RFP. But once it's launched, it by and large is run through CLC and Learfield IMG. And then the various venues, whether it is, you know, TCF Bank Stadium on advertising or UMD, uh, Morris, Crookston, whatever the case may be. I know it was mentioned, I think uh, Regent Kenyanya, in the docket, our current proposal is that the only place one would see advertising would be in athletic venues or other performing arts venues. So if there was another opportunity in a performing arts venue for a manufacturer to be a sponsor or to do advertising and the advertising already exists, that would be the place. This would never appear in student unions, dormitories, classrooms, anything like that. Madam Chair, brief Yes, brief Regent question. Kenyano, did, oh yeah, quick question and then we're gonna go to uh, Regent Rosha and we'll conclude our discussion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, VP Kramer, thanks for the uh, responses. Those were very helpful and clarifying. When we talk about the, the market and you said you consulted with our peers, is is some of that, is part of that a reflection of, of you know, the market for this kind of sponsorship in college uh, athletics, but then also the U of M specifically, as in, is this going to vary if you go to another, you know, school in the uh, SAC or something like just based on their on their athletic profile. I don't know if that makes sense, but are, are, are other schools seeing higher revenues just based on their athletic brand? Uh, uh, yes, uh, Vice President Kramer. Uh, Madam Chair, Regent Kenyanya, absolutely. You know, the, the strength of your brand is the strength of the opportunity. Uh, in Minnesota, we have an extraordinarily strong brand. In fact, I think I know I've, I've briefed the regents before in our public opinion survey, we no longer even ask people, do they recognize the Block M? Because Minnesotans overwhelmingly recognize the Block M. But there's only a couple of national players. And so when you think of the Penn States, the Notre Dames, or some of the SEC schools, they have a much stronger national following. The interesting thing, though, is that applies for licensing that is likely, and I'm, I'm guessing on this, so this is an opinion, that applies to licensing that is likely more apparel. Because you may be a fan of, say, for example, Notre Dame, but live in Los Angeles and want to buy a sweatshirt or t-shirt or hoodie or something. For beverages, when you think what we're proposing, this would be, for sake of argument, a uh, paddle uh, or a castle danger up north, having a UMD bulldog beer just during the hockey season. And it's not going to be available necessarily at the deck. It might. I'm not in charge of that. But you would be able to buy it in a local liquor store. So there would be a promotion. When the hockey season is over, one, they would likely discontinue it because it would be seen as something special and it's costing them money to produce the cans. But more importantly, they're likely not going to be selling that UMD Bulldog beer in Worthington, Minnesota. 
It isn't that they don't want to. It's that they're looking at it purely as a business saying the cost of shipping it down there and the likelihood that a fan is going to want to buy that beer over another choice is relatively low. So the challenge on all of this is that consumption of alcoholic beverages from a national perspective may be the same, but as soon as you put a name on it, a Block M or an Ohio State or a Texas Longhorns, you immediately start narrowing the market. And that's just the challenge of this industry. Thank you, Vice President Kramer. We'll conclude with uh, Regent Rocha and then uh, that will conclude our meeting so we can move on to the Board of Regents meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, at, the, at the outset, I want to say that you know, when this came up, I, I'm not <clears throat> opposed as a rule against expanding and, and, and you know, there's the consistency with the fact that we sell alcohol at the facilities um, and, and, and permitting advertising doesn't seem out of, out of place for me. Um, and I was supportive of allowing uh, you know, the public to make decisions about whether they want to purchase alcohol in our facilities or not. I, I think, you know, I'm not a, um, I don't find myself restrictive that way. However, um, when you, it really comes down to the subjective for me um, as to how this impacts the university and echoing every other uh, speaker so far, um, the, you know, seeing 300,000 versus 3 million, uh, that's a big deal to me because I, I, I think there's value in the image that the University of Minnesota has had. And so that now rather than saying that there's a rule against this because it's alcohol, um, saying, does this make sense for us because it's, it's a relatively low amount of money. And, and the fact that, that we have been, you know, quote unquote, clean from, from advertising for uh, things that would fall into the vice category, whether it's alcohol, smoking, uh, gambling, whatever, um, you know, are we willing to give that up for simply 300000 minus the costs, as pointed out by Madam Chair, and additional money that would then be sent to, to deal with, with uh, uh, alcohol uh, use issues? Um, I also think that, that when I look at that number, and this was pointed out earlier, that you also have this concept of substitute advertising. Right now, we have people advertising, and in those locations, now you would, you know, I, I, the presumption is there'd be more opportunities. Um, at least that's that's what I'm gleaning from your comments, but I would here, here's my here's my great concern. First, I like the fact that we have a a good image, um, and and 300,000 may not be enough to to get at least one member of our board to to make that change. But this is what kind of concerns me. When I was reading through, I, I this doesn't limit the the advertising to the block M. I mean, this is all of our trademarks, all of our logos. So that's accurate, isn't it, Vice President Kramer? Uh, Madam Chair, Regent Roshi, yes. Yes. Yeah, and, okay. and so I mean, here's, you know, as, as, the, as the, the parent of, of three relatively young children, you know, I, I watched growing up, the, our federal government really struggle with the issue of Joe Camel and, and advertising for um, tobacco products. Goldie Gopher is very popular with kids. It's a, he's a cartoon character and, and, you know, wins national awards frequently. Um, and the idea that we would then be tying a very appealing character to alcohol use, um, especially for young kids. I, you know, I, again, I'm not an expert in how they came to the conclusions about restricting the types of advertising for tobacco products, but this would certainly kind of fall into that category. We're, we're talking about the Block M or, you know, or sort of more generally um, the, the University of Minnesota, it doesn't quite have that, that risk. And so I'm, I'm, I am concerned about how that imagery, you know, appeals to certain populations and so on and so forth. And, and, and so again, where it comes down is, is, the, the dollar amount, you know, certainly revenue, any revenue we can we can generate is is helpful for our enterprise. But at that number, compared to um, the values of a not marketing to children and b um, having you know having kept our marks clean all of this time, it, it's kind of a tough sell for me right now. And and uh, but I, I am open to the dialogue and and uh, um, we'll we'll continue the conversation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, anything further you want to add, Vice President Kramer, before we close out our discussion? Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. I do want to address uh, Regent Roche's comment, and I, I touched on it briefly when I was talking about the stylized Iowa Hawkeye logo. Regent Roche, it's entirely within our control which marks we allow. And I actually share your concern on Goldie Gopher. Um, I've been working really hard in this presentation not to say he or she or it, because I think it's just a gopher, but for any of our uh, mascots, that's within our control to decide whether it is used or not. 
Um, Madam Chair, members, I'll prepare some additional information on revenue in general associated with all of our licensing and sponsorships. But you might be curious to learn, it's relatively de minimis. Not that it isn't a large number, but for example, Gopher Athletics in FY20 earned 1.59 million in total on licensing deals. And so 300,000 is not a large amount. It may be a large amount when compared to the potential of adding to our total licensing and sponsorship. But again, Madam Chair, I'll prepare some additional information for all members. Thank you, Vice President Kramer. I think that would be highly helpful to us making our decisions because the seeing the number in a vacuum is obviously making an impression on a number of my colleagues. So that would be great. Uh, with that, then I will uh, We'll close the discussion, and uh, unless I hear otherwise, is there a motion to adjourn the governance uh, meeting and move on to the board meeting? So moved, Madam Chair. Second. All right. Then with that, uh, this meeting is completed. Uh, Mr. Steves or Ms. Dirksen, if you could tell us uh, when will we resume the board meeting? Uh, Madam Chair, it'll be in 15 minutes from, from now. So. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for an excellent discussion on both topics. And I look forward to discussing with you the work uh, that has been done by the board office on board assessment. I think just let me say I think it was excellent. And if you have any questions or pieces of information you would like from the board office, having seen those materials that you'd like to see when we have that discussion in February, please send them to Ms. Dirksen because that will help to move the discussion along. All right. See you in 15. Thank you.